Praise the God. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Who can speak of the mighty deeds of the Lord or can show forth all his praise? Our Savior desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Make me walk in the path of your commandments for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. Amen. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If you love me, keep my commandments. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. How blessed is the man who does not walk in counsel of the wicked. And where the boastful sinners talk, will he refuse to stand? doesn't join with men who scoff he dare not even sit among them but his delight is in God's law it is his hope and prayer
throughout the week. We have 2 Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians 3, 3. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Second Thessalonians 3, 3 But the Lord is faithful He will strengthen you He will guard you from the evil one But the Lord is faithful He will strengthen you He will guard you from the evil one Second Thessalonians 3, 3 But the Lord is faithful He will strengthen you Okay. <laughs> and now, speaking of Second Thessalonians, that is actually our Bible reading. Typically, we do a yearly cycle of Gospels and Acts, as it says there, but this is a Sabbath year, and so we're actually reading through the epistles. So today, we're going to be reading uh, the book of Second Thessalonians. Go ahead. Okay. Um, verse 1, Paul, Sylvanus, and, Tim and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. Therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of his faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. But no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, 
and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and the truth, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or, or our epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may be run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and to the patience of Christ. For we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but work in labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you, among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, the epistle so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to do a little game here. And we're going to see how well you are paying attention. Yes, it's time for Know Your Bible. Hello. All right. Yes. The case.
Greece for law. So uh, we just heard from Second Thessalonians, which mentioned this whole concept of lawlessness and uh, the. The son of perdition was the translation we had. My translation has uh, the son of lawlessness. It just kind of keeps that term going. Now, when it comes to society, yeah, we have a lot of confusion going on. And a lot of this confusion going on is really because of lawlessness. Unfortunately, we have to observe people doing a lot of self-destructive behavior. You know, they're just kind of falling because, well, they don't really know which way is up. <laughs> and uh, it's, very, it's very troubling for us to see this because uh, it, it can be hard to even know how to engage in somebody like this. Because here we are, we're basically standing on the edge of a building, and we know the, what gravity is. We understand if you walk off the building, you're going to fall. But other people don't, and so we just get to watch people do this and, uh, and walk off of the ledge and not understand the rules of the universe, the rules of morality, and so on. Funny thing about gravity. Now, the concept of gravity uh, itself is basically a bunch of laws that we now understand and we can study by looking at the universe. But if you look at the origin source of the theory of gravity, Isaac Newton, well... We see somebody who was very much an ethical monotheist, right? This is a statement he has. From this found the free will of God, it is those laws which we call the laws of nature have flowed, in which there appear many traces of the most wise contrivance, but not the least shadow of necessity. These, therefore, we must not seek from uncertain conjectures, but learn them from observations and experimental. He who is presumptuous enough to think that he can find the true principles of physics and the laws of natural things by the force alone of his own mind and the internal light of his reason must either suppose the world exists by necessity and by the same necessity follows the law proposed, or if the order, order of nature was established by the will of God, the man himself, a miserable reptile, can tell what was fittest to be done. So, you know, he takes a very strong idea and... The truth of the matter is, is we have built so much from our society based on the principles of a objective truth, right? And a system that you can observe and laws and all of these things. And it all comes back to a belief in God, belief in something, right? At least a central something. Uh, and I think this is what uh, Paul was getting at when he was talking about in Romans, where he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his internal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. In other words, you know, the fact that we can see that the world is an orderly system that we can observe and we can rely upon, well, that kind of puts you at an order maker. And obviously, it gets a little bit more complicated than that. I wouldn't say that you can rush out and convince an atheist with that simple of an argument. But, you know, this premise, the premise of an objective truth that there is one centralized idea that we're moving towards, you know, when you lose that, what happens is, is you end up in a very chaotic state. And the Bible really does equate a lack of belief of God with a lack of rules altogether, which is a little bit different than a lack of belief of God equaling a different set of rules. I think the distinction is important. As we were saying in 2 Thessalonians, he said, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And he was speaking about, you know, the final fallout before the return of uh, uh, Jesus Christ and all of that. However, this uh, notion of lawlessness really goes back to the very beginning. And we've certainly seen ebbs and flows of it in human history. You know, we've gone up and down in terms of how you could say ethical monotheist culture is, how much we really respect these notions. This is kind of a silly graph. It's not completely scientific. <laughs> but what it does show you is uh, there was a gap in terms of scientific advancement around this era. And this graph wants to ascribe it. They call it the Christian Dark Ages. But if you think about it, when was the Bible most obfuscated? Well, you've got a period of time right around there, right? Where you had a major church system that was designed against people reading the text. And really, well... The Catholic Church is not super monotheistic. Um, they don't necessarily emphasize that. There's a lot of let's appeal to this person, let's appeal to this person, which really gets kind of into a polytheistic notion. So that really wouldn't help organize society very well either. 
However, the thing is, is we need to keep in mind, okay, so when we get this biblical mindset, we get this ethical mindset, yeah, we have a lot of advancement. And it's no wonder that in the period of time when you had this kind of, you know, enlightenment and the biblical truth coming out, you had people that were digging deeper about a lot of issues, including issues that now Christians maybe are a little more soft on. For example, you know, here's a treatise, a treatise concerning the sanctification of the Lord's day, wherein the morality of the Sabbath or the perpetual obligation of the fourth commandment is maintained against adversaries. And this is not the kind of not <laughs> the kind of writing you would see nowadays. People are getting much more loose about it. Obviously, this gentleman thought the Lord's day was Sunday, which I disagree with, but he still thought the perpetual fourth commandment, right, which is certainly more beneficial than just getting lawless, you know, thinking it doesn't matter, thinking none of this matters. On the other hand, not just think, you know, well, those were the good old days, because that's not really true either. Um, as it says in Ecclesiastes, uh, say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Uh, while we certainly can respect the fact that eras that people were more ethically monotheist was more organized, that doesn't mean they didn't have their issues, right? But in that category about understanding the order of the universe, yeah, I think they were in that way better. And you could see just in so many areas, I mean, look at the music, look at the architecture, look at the art. You just see the signs of a healthier society in many ways than I think you are seeing now. Uh, nowadays, you have a lot of people, you know, standing on the shoulders of those geniuses, making a lot of advancements, but they're not the ones that are doing it because to some extent, they somewhat disregard the presuppositions that somebody like Isaac Newton made in the first place, right? All right, so we were going back to 2 Thessalonians reading today where it says, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all powers and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. This is a very strong language if you think about what it's connecting, right? It's connecting being lawless with a lack of belief in God, a lack of love of the truth, a lack of saved. You know, this is very strong language that kind of goes against the grain of what you often hear. A lot of people will want to separate out the commandments into something like, well, this is the activity we do in order to please God versus being this presuppositional, you know, God is a God of order. Therefore, we're going to want to understand the order he puts the universe into, right? It's a very different kind of concept. When you look at the term lawless, like I said, we have a situation where people have you know, the rules of, uh, from God, the commandments, right? And you can say, well, they reject it. Well, they don't instead create their own rules exactly. What the Bible is saying is actually, they basically say no rules exist at all. That more or less is where you end up. Uh, it's not so much a substitution of laws for these laws. It's more like, well, there are no laws. <laughs> and uh, I think in the current era, you can see that more and more, right? Because... When you think of things like law, a lot of law is definition, right? If you're going to make a contract with somebody, you kind of have to establish your terms up front. Otherwise, there's going to be confusion later on. We have somebody who works in, in legality, so he could explain that better than I can. But, <laughs> but, you know, if you don't define all kinds of terms within a contract, well, somebody will come back and they'll be like, well, you know, it could mean this or it could mean this. Well, the Bible does differ in those terms, right? And so now when we have a lot of confusion about what terms mean, you know, what does marriage mean? What does gender mean? And things like that. And you and a lot of it isn't even a substitute definition. It's more that there is no definition, right? There's your definition and there's my definition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is why I think the Bible talks about this as basically lawlessness. It's not really a substitute law. It's basically saying that there is no law whatsoever. Um, and this really goes back to the Garden of Eden. You know, what was the promise? For God knows that when you eat of it, the knowledge of fruit and evil, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, that it all just kind of dissipates, right? It's good and evil and it's this, mix, this mixed thing. It's not that... Um, it's not, and, and, and you will be individually like God, right? And then that's really poly, polytheistic. You know, you can decide what's good and evil for you. That person can decide what's good and evil for them. That person can decide what's good and evil for them, essentially, right? It's not, oh, you're going to be able to build up some sort of strong system and resist. It's, it's really chaotic, right? Everybody ends up being a system in of themselves, and you can't really build anything. There, there's, it's the idea of even making a system completely false. As uh, was said in the Incredibles, when everybody is super, 
that nobody is, right? <laughs> you know, so if we're all God, then there is no God, basically. <laughs> and as it says in the Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The Holy One, right? There is one truth, there is one objective standard. That is the beginning of wisdom. The understanding that this isn't all just subjective, right? Maybe one individual can't fully understand it, but that doesn't mean there isn't a single standard to, to a fall. To follow. You know, laws define, lawlessness divides, really, if you think about it, because lawlessness ultimately means everybody can decide whatever they want, whereas a law unifies everybody under a single terminology for anything. Like I said, you know, we have the point now where we don't know simple terms <laughs> of what things are because we are just disintegrating everything. And I understand, you know, sometimes this can get confusing because people can be like, why do we have so many denominations if, law, if, if being lawful, you know, in a defining terms unites? Well, I mean, that's because a lot of times people will make their definitions, unfortunately, from bad places, right? They will not presupposition scripture and they'll bring in traditions and they'll mix bag. And then, yeah, of course, you'll end up <laughs> where everybody's defining things differently. Of course. Uh, we just had this experience uh, lately with the pandemic, right? We could not define what uh, the virus was, how it operated. what would, And so obviously we couldn't agree upon the best way to mitigate against it because we didn't even define what it was. Um, and there's still a lot of questions from different people about what it is, right? And so you can see that was a very dividing thing. We all witnessed it, you know, and it really became, it came from lawlessness, not, um, and I'm not saying that in terms of, you know, more laws needed to be making. I'm saying in terms of the definition of what the thing was. We did not really understand by which laws the epidemic existed upon, right? So we couldn't really decide upon what would be the best way to handle it. As it says in 2 Corinthians, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness. Again, you have the strong language that associates being unrighteous with not having laws, right? And again, we see this, right? Uh, it's very hard to even interact with people that don't accept objective reality because what do you even agree upon? Like you have no, you really have no foundation to even start anything. Uh, and because uh, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Again, uh, you know, when we're rebellious against God, we're ultimately rebelling against the concept that there is a system in place, that there's something to be followed, that there is an objective morality standard. We're saying we can make our own standard. Because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. This is obviously something that happens, right? Uh, you can be very on fire for... God as a concept, you know, that there's some supreme being that cares about you and wants the best for you. But if you don't really want to accept the authority of the rules that that creator has made, that there's an organization to the universe, it's not going to last because you're going to flounder. You're going to go off in different directions. You're not going to behave the way that God is asking you to do. And that could lead you to creating a completely different vision of who God even is. And then, therefore, maybe even rejecting the concept that God could even exist because, you know, well, you, you have your beliefs and I have my beliefs and they're kind of equal. And then, like I said, if everybody <laughs> could decide that, it's like it, it, there is no God, right? Because it's, there's a bunch of them and your love of a single God is going to just go away. Um, in uh, Titus, it says, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. You know, this should be our attitude. Our attitude is in the face of all of this confusion, we should be all the more strong about what we know, what we can affirm. You know, our moral standards uh, should not be compromised and we should walk in boldness about them. Like I say, law uh, defined, lawlessness divides. So the more we walk in law and the more we we follow the moral standards of the bible the more unified we're going to be as a group the more unified we'll be as a culture etc cetera, etc cetera. and of course that means laws must come from scripture not from ourselves otherwise that's just another form of lawlessness right because it's not just making up rules we're talking about god's laws you know 
Here's a little uh, acronym I have. Laws define, us on, uh, laws define how to love God and our fellow man, answer moral questions, and walk in the way of righteousness. It's a nice way of thinking of the word law. <laughs> now, you'll notice, you know, we uh, follow this with our format here at Flair. You know, we begin with the concept that, you know, what are the greatest laws, and we need to keep the commandments, and love and commandments, and et cetera, et cetera. And this is because, you know, I want to emphasize this point, much like Paul is, you know, in a current state of humanity, where humanity is constantly rebellious, we have to remind ourselves of these presuppositions. Otherwise, we'll enjoy all the benefits of something like the theory of gravity and have no idea where it came from. <laughs> and we'll just think, oh, isn't it great? We're so smart. Well, it's not that we're so smart. It's because there's a god of order that we can study and we can learn from. And you, you can't have one in the, without the other, right? <laughs> As it says in Psalm 119, blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, but also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You know, that is our path as uh, Christians, you know, is we want to ground ourselves again in scripture, in what God defines for everything, you know, you can, like I said, you, we're getting to the point now that basic terminology of what things are is getting questioned. And this is because we're walking away from the biblical definitions of things. Which is actually in some ways making it a little easier to have certain conversations, right? Because I joke around with people with the dietary laws and I'm like, oh, okay, well, I accept the biblical definition of food just like I accept the biblical definition of marriage. And now that you can talk about things like the biblical definition of marriage, because that isn't an understood, People are more likely to understand the concept, you know, that God can define lots of things about our personal life. Um, as it said in 2 Thessalonians, we just read through this, you know, the coming of the lawless one uh, is by the activity saying with all powers and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception uh, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Again, you know, we have to have a love for truth, a single truth. We have to really pursue that and just ground ourselves in that. Um, and it's, it's hard because, you know, people will try to throw you off. They'll try to be like, well, how confident can you be? Well, if it's in the scripture, of course we can be confident, right? We can walk in confidence that it is the way that the world actually works. It's the way that morality is supposed to be. Um, be very mindful of people that try to undermine scripture or confuse uh, issues. I'm going to finish uh, with this from Psalm 119. This is the mem section. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimony are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. And I think this is, you know, like I said, in this time frame, it was, the, it was true back in Paul's era. It's certainly true now. We need to make sure that we are mindful of lawlessness and avoiding such.
Good afternoon. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. Daniel was speaking about uh, he, one of the things, one of the, let's put it another way. Daniel was quoting from 2 Thessalonians, and we had earlier a reading from 2 Thessalonians. And uh, there, the problem was some people, uh, in effect, were, were pushing prematurely the second coming of Christ in a deceptive way. On the other hand, there's also the problem of some people thinking he never, he won't return, even though he promised that he, that he would. Now, there's a person in this congregation who normally likes to take notes, so I'm, I'm going to warn that individual. This talk will be painfully difficult. You're going to have to have a pen in one hand and a calculator in the other. It's going to be very, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. But Jesus did promise. We have been uh, recently uh, commemorating his death, commemorating his resurrection, and uh, his visits with the with the his ascension, but then his his vis visits with the apostles, and then ultimately, uh, of course, he did ascend from the Mount of Olives. But he promised that he would return. And when he ascended from the Mount of Olives, which are, okay, okay, you want to go to uh, okay I thought you were going to saw, saw them. Okay, I, well anyway, you know you know what the Mount of Olives <laughs> looks like. But if you don't, you can look it up sometime. All right, anyway, but what did he, what happened when he ascended from the Mount of Olives? This was on the 40th day, so we're not quite, we're counting towards Pentecost. This is day number 14, but he, uh, he ascended on the 40th day and then came Pentecost on the 50th day, as you know. But when he ascended, uh, an angelic being said to the apostles as they're, as they're looking up, uh, you know, okay, I'm sorry, I'm getting out of hand. But <laughs> as they're looking up, what did he tell them? Now he had, now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men, well actually not only one, but two, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So this is a promise that we as Christians can, can, can have hope it gives us hope, it gives us encouragement. We know that ultimately he will return. And of course, he's going to set this world right side up. You know, we won't have the lawlessness that Daniel spoke about. And one of the ways that we understand that there is a God is that he actually inspired to be written prophecies that then took place years later, centuries later. And in some cases, it's going to be thousands of years later. And he, he says in the book of Isaiah, the 46th chapter, verses 9 to 10, But you remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. God is unique because he can tell us what's going to happen and then he can make sure it does happen. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Now, the book of Leviticus has some prophecies regarding God's relationship with Israel. And unfortunately, they continue to, I guess you could say disappoint him to use an understatement. They were supposed to be an example and they kept sinning. And he warned them about it in the book of Leviticus and in Deuteronomy. And in Leviticus, there are four places in Leviticus where you see this concept. I will punish you seven times for your, for your, for your, for your sinfulness. I will punish you seven times. You see that in Leviticus uh, 26, verse 18, verse 21, verse 24, and verse 28. Let's quote it from Leviticus 26, 28. And th then also I will walk contrary to you in fury. I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. Now there's more to that, which I want to talk about today. Evidently, if we look at the vast sweep of history, we find that the full potential of Israel was delayed for seven prophetic times. And seven, once they were punished very severely, there was going to be seven prophetic times before their final restoration. And let's take a look at that. Uh, we have the number seven in the book of Leviticus. It, does, it doesn't say seven times, it just says seven. And so times has to be assumed. And the word for seven in Hebrew 
in, there in Leviticus is Sheva, which is the feminine form for seven. So it, it, you would assume that the noun is going to be feminine. The adjective is feminine, the noun is feminine. And one of the, uh, the nouns for, for time is pa'am, which is feminine in Hebrew. So you could say seven times, but this word pa'am, times, is, it, it means like once, twice, three times. And there's some analogies in other languages if we have that. Uh, the word ves in Spanish, dos, una vez, dos veces, or the word mal in German. Like the word for, as I remember my German, noch mal means again, to do something uh, another time. So the word palm is like that. So this seven times, it could refer to intensity. I'm going to really get rough with you, you know, if you so, are so sinful, and I'm going to punish you seven times. But it could also mean seven times in terms of literal times. And that's evidently historically what happened. There was a period of seven prophetic times that passed over Israel. We're going to talk about that. Uh, and uh, the idea is, what is a time? I want to define today a time as part of this talk. So let's go back to uh, Noah's Ark. And now let's go to the Enterprise. Uh, <laughs> okay, so if you, if you look at the Enterprise, there's a captain's log. There's a star date, all right? Well, Noah, Noah had a captain's log, and the way he kept time was uh, uh, he had evidently uh, uh, 12 months of 30 days. And uh, here you see the example of, a th of 30 day months. In this, of Genesis 7:11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, uh, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. So it's the uh, second month, 17th day of the month. So let's go now to uh, Genesis 8:3 to 4. And the waters receded continually from the earth at the end of 150 days. Oh, 150 days. That's three times five. Okay. Uh, the waters and the waters decreased and the ark rested in the seventh month and on the 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. So evidently he was working with 30 day months and uh, the ancient Egyptians uh, had that kind of calendar. They had uh, 12 30 day months and then five extra days at the end. That, so he seems to be uh, using a calendar that we find in ancient Egypt. Now, we have a principle in Bible prophecy that there are times when God uses a day for a year in prophecy. And here we have an example in Numbers 14.34. The spies were out 40 days, they sinned, and so Israel wandered in the desert. Well, not the whole nation sinned, not just the spies. Ten of the spies sinned, two, two were righteous, but the nation as a whole sinned. So 40 years they were wandering in the wilderness. According to the number of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days. For each day you shall bear your guilt uh, one, uh, one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. So we have the principle of a day for a year in prophecy. It comes up again in Ezekiel 4, 6. He had to lie on his side, on one side, lie on the other side. And here's an example in Ezekiel 4, 6. And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side. Then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have laid you a day for each year. So there, were, there was a 40-year period of judgment that came upon Judah, and Ezekiel lay on his side 40 days to indicate that. So we all, we're all together on that, right? Day for a year in prophecy. We have Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. It's very famous, uh, the uh, verses 24 through 27, where we have weeks of years. Uh, Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, where we have a, the principle of a day for a year. Okay, now let's talk about defining then a biblical time. What is the seven times that we read about in Leviticus? And here we have Daniel uh, seeing an angelic figure, uh, or more than one. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? We're talking here about the climax of human history. We're talking here about the end time, a time of tribulation like labor pains before the coming of the Messiah. So how long will this period last? Then I heard uh, uh, the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for time, times, and half a time. When the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. So we have a Hebrew word here, um, the word moed, which seems here to uh, apply to a predetermined period of time. 
and we have time times and half a time, so theoretically we could say three and a half times, whatever the times are, right? Time times, so that would be two, right? And then half a time, so three and a half times. So we have that three and a half times before the, you know, it, it winds up, before history comes to an end, and, and then finally we have the, the uh, Messianic age. So let's now go to the book of Revelation and see if we can nail this down a little bit more. Revelation 12, 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that, she, that he should feed her the, uh, there for 1,260 days. Oh, 1,260 days. If you use 12 months of 30 days, that, that's a three and a half year period. And that would be easy to calculate. You could see why God would give us a, a prophetic month of 30 days because it would be easy then to calculate. So let's go now to a parallel scripture where, where, where we can get benefit. We have a parallel scripture in, in Leviticus 12, 14. We're not necessarily talking about Wait, this. I'm sorry, no, Revelation 12, 14. <laughs> I misspoke there. Revelation 12, 14. That's why you have to have people around that can, that can catch you when you make a mistake. But uh, anyway, the point I want to make is this is not necessarily the same period of time, but it is obviously a parallel. It, and what does it say here? But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time for the present, from the presence of the serpent. Oh, so here we have 1260 days and then we have time times half a time. So there seems to be a, a parallel there that time, that three and a half times is 1260 days or three and a half years of, of 12 um, months in a year with 30 days in a month. Have I lost you? Oh, you're with me. Oh, great. All right. Now, let me give you some other examples of, of where that comes out in the book of Revelation. And I will give power to my witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So here again, we have, it seems, three and a half years. Uh, we have uh, 42 months would be three and a half years times 30 days, 1,260 days. Are we still there? Everybody all right? And now we have Revelation 13, 5. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and, and he was given authority to continue 42 months. So we have it defined as time times half a time, 1260 days, 42 months. So it, it all ties in back with, with Noah's captain's log in a way. And this gives us a way of, of understanding these prophecies uh, of a day for a year. So we have in effect, a prophetic time is a prophetic year of 360 days, is my contention. That a, a prophetic time is a year of, 700 and, of 360 days. And when God says he's going to punish you seven times, it means that history is going to go on and it'll take seven times until the full restoration of his people, of the people of Israel. Seven times 360 is 2,520 years. So from the time the punishment fell upon them fully, we now are going to project 2,520 years into the future for, for the restoration to begin. And so God prophesied about that way ahead of time, and it happened. We're going to see now. We have the Babylonian captivity. The northern tribes are already gone. Now the southern tribes are punished. We have the Babylonian captivity. And uh, yet, Jeremiah told them, there is hope. Uh, you know, the Israeli national anthem today is called Hatikva, the hope. He, uh, Jeremiah told them there was going to be a hope that Israel would someday be restored, even though they were about to be punished. Jeremiah 31.10. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. And then in Jeremiah 31. Thus says the Lord, a voice was heard from Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. So again, comforting them, even though he's telling them God will punish them, he's also comforting them that there will be an ultimate restoration. There is hope for your in your future. This is Jeremiah 31, 17. There is hope in your future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own border. Now, 
the final punishment on the, on, on the Jews, you could say, came when there were refugees who uh, were told by Jeremiah, don't go to Egypt. God doesn't want you going there. But they fled there anyway. And then, from what I understand historically, in 568 BC, Nebuchadnezzar invaded Egypt. And so the Jews who fled there, many of them, perhaps most of them, uh, died there, perished there in Egypt. Just a small remnant were able to finally come back to, to Israel later. So uh, the final punishment, you could say, maybe came at that time, 568 BC. But five years earlier, God in his mercy showed a vision to Ezekiel. And ev this, evidently this began the countdown towards the ultimate restoration of Israel. Let's look at this vision of Ezekiel. If you look at the end of the book of Ezekiel, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, this is a vision of the millennium of the future of a restored Israel in every way, spiritually and physically restored. And it begins in the 40th chapter. In the 25th year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, on the 10th of the month, 10th day of the month, in the 14th year of the, uh, after the city was captured, on, that, on the very same day, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there in the vision, visions of God. He took me into the land of Israel. He was in captivity now, Ezekiel. He was in Mesopotamia, what is today Iraq. But God in vision took him back to Israel. In the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain. On it toward the south was something like the structure of a city. Now, the date is given here. You can check it out. It's April 28th. 573 B.C. April 28, 573 B.C. Now project forward 2,520 years. And remember, there is no year zero. So you have to go from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D. It's a, it's a quirk in the calendar. So if you go 2,520 years from this date, you come up almost exactly to the day that Israel declared its independence, uh, which was the fifth day of the second month, and they'll be celebrating it in a few days as I'm giving this talk. The fifth day of ER, the fifth day of the second month, which is May 14th of 1948. So 2,520 years later, almost to the day, a restoration did begin. And we ha well, perhaps we'll have that scene. Uh, here's David Ben-Gurion reading the Declaration of the Independence of the State of Israel on the eve of the Sabbath, Friday, May 14th, 1948. And it turns out that it was 2,520 years roughly after the vision of Ezekiel. Now, there were partial restorations. There was a partial restoration. At, they came back from the Babylonian captivity, some of them, only, only a portion. But then the, the Romans dis, d destroyed the nation again, and there were revolts against Rome in the second century that were put down. So from the second century on, we have now the Jews as a scattered people, homeless. And on the Day of Atonement, at the end of the Day of Atonement, what did they say? The Shana Haba'ab Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. And on the Festival of Unleavened Bread, on the on the night to be much observed, the Seder night, what did they say at the end of the Seder? Next year in Jerusalem. And centuries and centuries went by. But they knew the promise was there. The promise was in God's word that they studied. And they knew the promise was there. And now we have, you know, as I'm speaking in 2022, uh, we have a, a significant percentage of the Jewish people back in their ancestral homeland. And even though there are tremendous challenges, the progress that country has made is astounding. And this is just, as, as we understand the beginning of the restoration of Israel, it's just a, a beginning. Ultimately, you know, we have a reunion of all the 12 tribes. We have, of course, the second coming of Christ. We have resurrection of King David. You know, all of these prophecies are yet to be fulfilled. But we are, in effect, living through the beginning, the first step of that restoration. In my opinion, it, it, it occurred seven times after that, that uh, final punishment uh, uh, over, over, over Judah uh, seven biblical times ago. Now, as I said earlier, there are those who want to try to speed up Christ's return, and I, I don't blame them. <laughs> but, but you know, we, but you can't do it, and it, and it can be and it can be harmful if if you try to pan, put people in panic mode about it. You know, because we have to plan our lives in a balanced way. But on the other hand, there's also the cynics, the skeptics, who say he'll never come. And there are probably some churches who may even teach that concept of, well, you know, really, he's 
You know, the kingdom of God is not really a literal thing and so on. And Peter talks about that. Uh, here's what he says uh, in, his, in his final epistle. Behold, I now write to you this second epistle, uh, in both uh, of which I stir I don't think this is what I want. Well, let's, let's, let, let me read it and, and then see if we get to the second verse. And, and, and it will, All right, good. So, okay. All right, let's go on. Let me, re let me read it. <laughs> Behold, now I, I now write to you the second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and, and of the commandment of us, the apostles, the Lord and Savior. And of course, this is what Daniel was talking about earlier, but it's what I'm talking about too, that the prophets you know, what they said is going to happen. Uh, and yeah, that's true. Uh, we, this is what, in fact, what I want to read. <laughs> Knowing this first, that scoffers will come, and I'm talking about that, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where's the promise of his coming? You know, that, that's unfortunately what, where, where some are. Uh, what, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water. They forget that in fact God has intervened in human history in a very dramatic way. Uh, in other words, it's not just a matter of deism that God turned down the switch and then walked away and you know whatever happens, happens. God is directly involved in, in human affairs. He's, he's guiding and directing human affairs. And as I said, you know, all these centuries, the Jews kept saying, we'll get back there someday. And now, uh, within our lifetime, depending how long we live, but it won't be long before the majority of the world's Jews are living in that land. However, that's just, as I said, the first step in the ultimate restoration that we can read about in Ezekiel. So let's take a look at what Jesus Christ himself said. And of course, we, we all know this, but let's give a few examples. We just celebrated the Passover season. And uh, at that Last Supper, he said this, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And he said to them before his arrest, John 14, 1 through 3, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. He's coming back. When that Passover season came, when he was about to be arrested and crucified, he came to, to Herod's temple and he was um, challenged there, or actually he was challenged, but then he, he met all the challenges and then he challenged them and he gave them a scripture that they could not explain because it really was a prophecy about himself. And he, he quoted from Psalm 110 in verse one. You can read about it in the, in the Synoptic Gospels. The Lord said to my Lord, or the, you know, Yahweh said to Adoni, the, Lord, uh, the Eternal said to my Lord. The, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So he's at the right hand of his father waiting to come back and waiting to, in effect, conquer the world. And each day we pray for that. We look forward to it and we know it is sure, but yet we're, we're commissioned, we're commanded to pray about it. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So indeed we understand, we have this hope and it is sure. The time is coming when Revelation eleven fifteen will be fulfilled. Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. He will return. All right, so I warned you, we're gonna do it. Second Thessalonians 3.3, let's see if you remember. But the Lord is faithful, he will strengthen you, he will guard you from the evil one. He's a very friendly, happy golden doodle. We thought, oh, 
this is going to be so sad, he's, he's not going to be able to run like he used to, but it hasn't slowed him down at all. He was going after something, it was clear, but we didn't know at first. <laughs> he came to shore and he had something in his mouth and it turned out to be a very tiny otter. kind of a harrowing trip because it was closing at six o'clock and we, we didn't know if we were gonna make it. He was really gentle and I think he, he knew it needed help and so he brought it right to us right away. a really special Easter Sunday, something yeah. we'll remember for a long time. says in his heart that there is no God above. They're corrupt in every part, but they only talk of love. All their plots and all their plans aim to kill the righteous man. Not a one does any good. Not a one has understood. down from hell, sifting all the thoughts of man, searching every single heart, 
for the one who understands. But they all have gone astray, everyone to his own way. Not a one does any good, not a one has understood. Lift your voices, God is near The ungodly are in fear From Mount Zion, Sega fly Raise your glory to the sky Bring your children safely home Oh, Savior, Pray on the poor as if they're bread. Soon will come the blessed day when God strikes their souls with dread. See them tremble then with fear, for the Holy One draws near. God is with the righteous poor, He is with them evermore. Oh, rejoice! Let your hearts be sad Let your voices God is near The ungodly are in fear From Mount Zion Save your fly Raise your glory to the sky Bring your children safely home Oh Savior come Oh rejoice Oh be glad Do not let be sad. Let your voices, God is near. The ungodly are in fear. From Mount Zion, Savior, fly. Raise your glory to the sky. Bring your children safely home. Oh, Savior, come. services and of course we are going to have down to Pentecost and we'll have events for that.